Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, fourth high-level session that is themed at access and innovation for revitalizing the SDGs. Um, we are more than pleased to be having you all here back again. I am Shivani Thapabasneth, uh, a journalist, uh, a news editor with uh, Nepal Television. So I'm basically based in Kathmandu and do get opportunities like this to be a part of uh, the uh, assembly of minds uh, like this. And it indeed is a matter of great privilege. So we're now getting the stage set and please welcome my a set of distinguished panelists who will be joining us here at the High Level Session 4th. It's with much pleasure we welcome all our panelists as they take on the stage, ladies and gentlemen. This is requesting all our panelists to kindly be seated. Your name plates have been put up on the tables next to uh, your seats, so it wouldn't take I mean, it would take less than a, a minute to find your places. Thank you so much. It's such a Pleasure to see you all here. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Right. Thank you. So pleased to see you back here again. Okay, so let's get to business right away. As I've been saying, this is the fourth high-level session here at the 18th IGF. And it is themed at access and innovation for revitalizing the SDGs. Now, SDGs have, as we all know, very, very central to um, bringing the entire uh, uh, globe and the stakeholder communities uh, to create a synergy, so as to create uh, a, a go, uh, I mean, a synergy amongst all the actions, inputs, efforts uh, towards creating, uh, a, a go, a, a, the, I mean, attaining the developmental goals, uh, and that also in an equitable and inclusive manner. We have had, I think, uh, uh, talked much about this even in the preceding sessions, wherein we did talk about. Uh, uh, about the SDGs, about how, uh, what is the status of some of the SDGs or majority of the SDGs and how far we are and how much we need to add impetus in order to uh, meet up to the pace uh, uh, among all these stakeholders to reach the goals that we have set for us. Uh, inequality, as stated by the major panelists, uh, panelists in all the sessions uh, that proceeded in the morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you all could uh, see that their reflection was pretty much univocal and they were in consensus to uh, state that inequality. And then there are other, other newer challenges uh, like climate change uh, that are emerging in front of us in addition to our traditional problems that have posed a lot of challenges and threats even for us to uh, keep that pace and to reach the SDGs that we have set for ourselves. So unequal access to opportunities and basic service, as we all know, such as education and healthcare, these obstruct the path of the, these are uh, obstructing the path of sustainable development. Now, uh, leveraging digital solutions can bridge historically persisting gaps as well as uh, help us, uh, as I said earlier, help us through innovative technologies and innovative solution, curtail and prevent newer challenges like uh, climate change and so forth. And applying digital technologies to secure their maximum uh, benefit entails a specific commitment to integrating rights at every milestones of SDGs. Equality and non-discrimination are central, as we all know, to the goals, uh, especially to the sustainable, as we all know, sustainable development relies on a strong rights regime that promotes peaceful and inclusive societies and ensures public access to information and freedom of expression. Now, the synergy between access and innovation is not merely aspirational. It's a pragmatic uh, strategy for revitalizing the SDGs and digital technology supported by effective policy can address multiple challenge. This would be the food for the for deliberation in course of this uh, one hour plus long session with our host of panelists. Allow me to introduce our distinguished panelist for the session, beginning with His Excellency Mr. Junhua Lee, the United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Welfare Affairs. Welcome to the panel, sir. 
Likewise, we are pleased to have Ms. Caroline Ed Stalder, the Federal Min Honorable Federal Minister for European Union and Constitution Austria. Warm welcome to you to the panel. Equally pleased we are to be welcoming Mr. Shild Z. Marlauer, Rector, United Nations University. In fact, we are very, very much pleased to have Ms. Nanako Ishido, Professor, Keio University Graduate School of Media Design. It's a pleasure to have Mr. Mohammed Sharif, the Honorable Minister of State for Environment, Climate and Technology, the Maldives. Welcome to the panel, sir. We are very, very much pleased uh, to have Mr. Masanori Kondo, the Secretary General, Asia Pacific Telecommunity. Also, we are pleased to have Ms. Liz Fur, the Director General, European Telecommunications Networks Operators Association, ETNO. And last but not the least, we have with us Mr. Kozo Boyke, the Vice President, Public Policy Africa, Middle East and Turkey from Meta. A uh, very, very warm welcome to all our distinguished panelists. Now, without further ado, let us uh, quickly dive into the questions we have set for the day. I would uh, put forth a host of questions per relating to the theme and would come to you turn-wise. First and foremost, um, let's begin with the UN Under Secretary General himself. What do you think are some current global examples of leveraging digital solutions for the achievement of the specific SDGs? Well, thank you, uh, moderator. Good afternoon. It, uh, it's good to do, uh, be with you to, uh, this afternoon for this uh, a very outstanding uh, issue. I'm so glad to hear from you. Uh, digital is linked to the attainment of the SDG in almost all the aspects. Uh, from us, from the UN Secretariat, we certainly believe digitalization <coughs> offers a very unique opportunities. In many, area, uh, in many areas, and it's the key to achieving the SDGs. For instance, uh, digital solutions can improve the financial inclusion, uh, increase the effectiveness of the public services, and also accelerate the climate action, education, and the hunger and the poverty eradication. To us, a digital solution is more than just a technology or infrastructure. It is about tackling complex human challenges and to achieve the sustainable development. Digital solutions should be guided by priorities and the principles contained in 2030 development agenda, as well as the pressing needs for developing countries, because we know uh, when we implemented that our SDG goals and all the 2030 agenda. Now we don't have uh, any satisfactory data to indicate that we achieved enormously, actually, uh, or on country, we left it far behind. Almost all the SDG targets are off track. Only 15% are on the track. So last month, so the world leaders gathered in New York uh, adopted the political declaration by consensus, they recommitted themselves to take bolder action um, to bridge the gaps, bridge the divides, including to spread the benefits of the digitalization and expand the participation of all countries, especially developing countries. So that is why that I absolutely convinced that we need to embrace and harness the digitalization. Thank you. Right. So thank you so much for uh, vouching for technology or digital uh, s sector as a tool to speed up the needed uh, approaches or you know, energy for uh, reaching the SDGs, sir. Moving to Ms. Caroline Ed Stalder, the Federal Minister for European Union and Constitution Austria, what would be your thoughts to these particular questions? First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I think this high-level panel is really an, a very important one, and I'm also responsible as a federal minister for coordinating the SDGs and implementing them in Austria. So we are currently preparing the second uh, review, uh, and we will present it in, in July in, in uh, New York. Well, I think we find ourselves in a watershed moment, and if I'm talking about we, then I mean the whole international community. We have artificial intelligence in all 
all of our hands. Everyone is using it. Uh, we use it in so many fields, uh, and I think this, that these emerging technologies will be the key drivers in so many um, fields. Turning to one of my focus uh, topics, uh, the human rights uh, side of you, I would uh, see that uh, we can um, easily uh, use it in a better way to have uh, the, the necessary skills to, to, to use it uh, also to gather information, so to organize gatherings and discussing things. And I would say this would help a lot to express and exchange opinions and thoughts freely to, to gather information and yeah, organize peaceful assemblies. So we, we find ourselves also in a world where nearly everything is... is different than we thought uh, only a few months ago and, and these t um, days and these hours we get also horrifying um, infos from Israel. So um, I would say that these new technologies should be used in the best way also to get the knowledge and the information regarding human rights and democracy to really install the rule of law everywhere and uh, make the world a better one and this is really needed at that moment. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. Let's move to uh, Maldives, a nation which is in the forefront of bearing the brunt of uh, the consequences of climate change. What are your say on this? If you could share your perspectives on some current global examples of leveraging digital solutions for the achievement of SDGs. Thank you. Let me start by uh, thanking the IGF Secretariat and uh, UNDESA uh, for inviting us and uh, uh, letting us have a say here. When we, when we look at global examples, right, um, global examples of how dig digital can be utilized in achieving the SDGs, um, we have SDG 1 and 2, right? Uh, talking about no hunger and talking about um, zero poverty. If you, if, you look, if you look at the statistics, over two billion people still do not have a bank account. So, access, But we already know from practice that access to digital financial service is a wonderful method, method to lift people out of poverty. So there are global initiatives who, is, uh, who are working on this. If you look at hunger, for example, smart agriculture, this is where emerging tech comes to play. Technologies like artificial intelligence, cloud computing, sensors, uh, drones, blockchain can be utilized and already are being put to use in smart agriculture vertical farming so that we can tackle SDG 2. If you look at SG, uh, SDG 9, for example, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, efficient and affordable IT, IT ICT in, infrastructure and services will help countries like ours right, engage in the digital economy and boost our global competitiveness. So, so and, and this is happening. This is happening not just in the developed world, this is happening in the developing as well as the least developed world that we are investing in digital uh, to do this. In the Maldives, if you take the example of the Maldives, over the last year, year and a half, we've been actually focused on upgrading our digital identity systems. Right? Public digital infrastructure is one of the key technologies we need to look at when we want to um, expedite the delivery of SDGs. Uh, as the US, uh, US uh, S, uh, sorry, UNSG has pointed out, we are behind. We are, we are very, we, we, we are, it looks like we will miss our target for the people, planet, and prosperity. So we prioritizing public digital infrastructure like digital identity can help tackle things like SDG 1, poverty, SDG 2, hunger, and also things like gender equality. So if you look at um, SDG 16, particularly 16.9, there is, there is a provision to provide legal identity by, for everyone by 2030. I think if we can do that, 
and con concentrate on um, other public digital identity, uh, sorry, other public digital infrastructure, like financial, uh, uh, digital finance, like digital agriculture, we can definitely expedite the, at the pace at which we are achieving the SDGs today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Let me turn to the experts from the policy leaders now. Uh, j just a reminder, in case you are not uh, aware of it, we have a timer on these screens. So your time ends uh, before it, the, the color of the timing changes. So this is just, just, uh, just drawing your attention. Thank you so much for your kind understanding. So moving to the pool of experts now on the very question, let us begin with Ms. Lees for the Director General of European Telecommunications Networks Operators Association. Well, um, for us, digital is an interesting uh, concept when we think about the STGs. There is no specific SDG uh, about digital development or digital governance. And if you look at it with the lens of 2023, we see digital technologies and AI assume even a, a greater role in all part of, of our lives. So digital solutions actually pervade many of the SDGs in some way, mostly in relation to harnessing of high quality connectivity to make the world a better place or the uptake of vital skills. So um, this year, the UN's uh, SDG reports highlight some of the places where digital can help us drive towards the SDGs and places where digital shortcomings are holding us all back. So let's look at uh, SDG number four, that is quality education. This is of course linked to eliminate, eliminating poverty, goal one, decent work and economic growth, goal eight, and reduced inequalities, goal 10. Uh, connectivity is fundamental, but if there is no access to devices, the networks remain unused. So um, connectivity and devices are a huge step forward. And indeed, billions of people today, of course, use the internet. But we also see skills are lacking, meaning that the full benefit cannot be realized. So when digital solutions are properly divided, connectivity, devices, and skills, digital is an extremely powerful tool for achieving these people-centered uh, SDGs. And I would like to add that we're seeing digital solutions being used right across the economy and society, supporting in climate change mitigation, making industry and agriculture more sustainable, and making our cities not less harmful to the environment, but also not only less harmful to the environment, but also more livable. Thank you. Thank you. Let us read from Meta's perspectives now. Can we hear your thoughts, Mr. <coughs> Kuzuo Boyek? Hi, thank, thanks ever so much and very, very pleased to be here and thank the audience for their attention. Uh, a couple of things I've heard as my learned friends have, have spoken. One from my friend from Etno about the fact that actually we can't rely on the fact that people having access to broadband networks, as the recent Broadband Commission report suggests, 95% of people are, are within range of a network. It doesn't mean that everybody has access to broadband or indeed uh, the technologies that uh, 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 offer so much promise in terms of AI. So I just wanted to kind of stress that point. 2.6 billion people still remain offline and won't have access to broadband or the innovative technologies that ride upon it. I'll probably provide a, a concrete example of, of the way in which tech could be used to achieve an SDG, or indeed all the SDGs. Um, uh, Meta has been working for more than 10 years using AI. Some of the biggest investments we've made using AI are in our connectivity work, and I spoke in the panel this morning about the many investments we've made in connectivity, so I won't belabor the point. But a, an, a positive externality of that work was, was our quick understanding that actually when it came to understanding where people were, population density, information was just scarce or poor. Even when we had census data, it didn't tell us where uh, 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 most people lived. It told us broadly where they were, but not where they lived. We took a step where we took some AI satellite uh, uh, imagery and applied that to the census data as well to produce some of the world's most sophisticated population density maps in collaboration with the University of uh, Columbia University. We then open sourced that and open sourced that to the UN uh, Humanitarian Data Exchange for more than 150 countries. 
those maps are now used by everybody from the World Bank to particular governments and universities who are trying to drive the kind of impact we want to see on the sustainable development goals. So this is just a shout out to AI in the, in, in the, in the first part, and actually positive externalities that come from trying to achieve some business goals at the same time. And also a shout out basically because of what I've heard, I'm just 10 seconds over, you moderator, from what I heard from New York, that there is so much opportunity and risk, we understand the risk, but so much opportunity offered by AI that we are at an inflection point where we need to take that opportunity. And I'm very, very keen to have a discussion about all of that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this profound sharing and your special emphasis on the positive sides. Uh, to Ms. Nanako Ishido, the professor at Keio University Graduate School of Media Design. Hi, thank you, moderator. And first of all, welcome everyone to Japan and welcome to Kyoto. I'd like to introduce Japan's Giga School Initiative as a digital solution towards achieving the SDGs Goal 4, which aimed to provide quality education for all. Before the outbreak of COVID-19, Japan was somewhat behind in integrating digital technology into school education. We were, in fact, ranked last among OECD countries in terms of both infrastructure development and effective utilization of digital technologies. However, the pandemic triggered a significant change Japan distributed the digital device to every elementary and middle school student nationwide. This marked a major step towards addressing education disparities and bridging digital divide. We commenced this initiative in 2020, and from what I hear, it's been going pretty smoothly with no, uh, with no significant setbacks. I believe this could serve as a valuable example globally to ensure that everyone has digital literacy and to eliminate digital divide. It is crucial to provide equal access to digital learning environment with our, our educational institutions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you for your very uh, warm words. And of course, even personally, I believe Japan is su such a best suited hub for a forum like IGF because uh, personally, I believe so, and I'm sure many of you do uh, agree with me that there is so much to learn for many of us, especially the curious minds and the aspiring hearts uh, from the journey of Japan and from the achievements that Japan has uh, achieved so far. Uh, thank you to IGF, IGF Secretariat and to the host country uh, representing the panel. Let's move on and let's uh, move, uh, yes, as we are focusing on Asia again and the Asia Pacific telecommunicate uh, community must have a lot to share with us based on their experience and their observation. Uh, Moving to Mr. Masanori Kondo, the Secretary General of Asia Pacific Telecommunic uh, Community. Sir, what are the technical, regulatory, policy, and other challenges in promoting and implementing digital solutions for revitalizing the SDGs and achieving the Agenda 2030? Okay, uh, thank you, moderator. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to the IGF Secretariat for inviting me for this very important session, as well as the host country, Japan, for its hospitality. Then, uh, with regard to the question, uh, how, what, the, what are the challenges in promoting and implementing digital solution, uh, keeping in mind that the theme of this session is accessibility. Of course, accessibility, especially affordable accessibility, is very important, and in this aspect, I think both uh, technology and the policies uh, continue to be updated. But based on my uh, experience in, in the organization, I would like to share one thing here today. So on site, people don't introduce digital solutions, not because they cannot use it, but because they don't think it is necessary. So people have their own daily life and business, and they are too busy to dare introduce new things that require, requires time and effort to learn to use. So then it is necessary to promote innovation, including innovative idea, that makes things attractive enough to move from status quo to new challenges. 
So, but uh, at the same time, innovation doesn't come from a survey or qu questionnaires for potential uh, users. So we need to keep in mind that it is important to have entrepreneurship spirit in the supply side who try to promote uh, digital solutions. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Ishido. Uh, Mr. Kondo, I beg your pardon. Uh, coming to uh, Ms. Caroline Edstel, uh, as a policy leader, what are your thoughts about this? Well, um, I think that we have to do especially one thing. We have to connect the unconnected, and we have to reconnect the disconnected, because there is also um, a, a big danger in artificial intelligence and all the new technologies, because uh, we risk uh, that there is a reinforcing of existing social and economic uh, inequalities. And uh, it was already mentioned on this panel also, um, we saw that it is needed to have all these technologies to, to stay connected, especially during COVID-19. Uh, it, it was something where we saw firsthand how important this technology is. Then we saw a boost of getting these new technologies to universities, to schools, to even elder people who used it to get in touch with uh, their, I don't know, grandsons and, and, and granddaughters, and it became normal. But now we really have to see that we get it in all the fields of the SDGs also. And also, at, uh, as Lisa already uh, mentioned, maybe we need SDGs for the internet, especially, to, to do so and, and to be um, really on, on, the right, uh, on the right side. It was mentioned it is important for SDG 4 and SDG 8, access to education and employment. You have a lot of chance, chances uh, lying in, in these fields, but also SDG 3, as it was mentioned by you, Lisa, I think it's really important, uh, especially in times where we have a, a lack of trained people in nearly all the fields uh, of, of our uh, lives, and this could really help us to facilitate um, the, these things, but the precondition is to connect all the unconnected people and to see it not, also, not only from the perspective of the Western world, um, but also from the global south. And I think this is a big, big challenge. Uh, we only can uh, do it if we strengthen our forces together. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Moving to uh, the Academia, Mr. Chilzi Marwala. Uh, you've heard from the policy leaders, you've heard from experts. What is your observation on the challenges uh, facing the digital solutions for revitalizing SDGs? No, no, no. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I think there are actually two main challenges. The first one is governance. And of course, in governance, the principles are actually quite simple. We should uh, maximize uh, the good use of AI and minimize the bad use of AI. And what are some of these good uses? Uh, uh, we have talked about agriculture, which deals with uh, SDG 1 and 2, health, education, govern uh, and, uh, and governance. The second one is access. And access here, uh, uh, you know, means uh, access to data. I used to be director of the University of Johannesburg. And during COVID, and when we sent people home, uh, it was clear that uh, not everybody has access to data. And we had to go and buy uh, data packs for students, uh, which was quite expensive for more than 50,000 students. And the second one is uh, access to technology. And maybe just back on the data, uh, today we talked about uh, data flow uh, between countries and so on and so forth, and the security around the governance around that, which we should not forget. Then the second one is technology. Whether it is devices, uh, when, uh, if I were to go back to my experience uh, in Johannesburg, procuring 26,000 devices within basically weeks is not actually quite uh, easy. So we need to ensure that uh, you know, uh, we are able to train countries to be able to, especially small countries, to work together with other countries so that they can have economies of scale 
that when they are buying these technologies, I see my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marwala. I would want to stay with you with my other question. Um, we, in a way, agree that SDGs are very, very much um, critical in promoting prosperity, equality, and also the emerging, the newer problems, right? There, there is a consensus among all. Uh, if you could shed light uh, on which SDGs are lagging behind in terms of unlocking the value of digital solutions. Well, I mean, maybe just in general, uh, we are lagging behind in almost all SDGs. Only 15% of uh, SDGs we are actually, uh, of, 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 of the, um, the goals, the indicators, uh, uh, we, are lagging, we, we have actually uh, met uh, uh, our goals. Uh, about 50% of them, we are off track and the rest we are worse than we were before. So we are lagging quite behind. Now, if I were to answer your question specifically on unlocking digital uh, opportunities, it is quite clear that education is at the forefront of that. And education here varies from uh, the specialist education to just digital literacy. Uh, digital literacy is actually becoming a human rights issue. Uh, my mother, who, who receives uh, an old age pension in South Africa, is supposed to be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to use these devices, and I have taught her how to use these devices, uh, is to collect this uh, uh, her, her pension rather than go and queue for hours. So, so education is quite important across the board. And the second thing is infrastructure. Uh, uh, we need infrastructure to be able to use these technologies. Um, and then the third thing is data. Again, the issue of data. They say data is the new oil. I don't like the, 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 the word oil. Uh, I hope data is going to be a much, much better form of, of, of oil in terms of renewability. You know? but, but those are some of the things that we need to do in order to uh, to unlock, uh, and of course the issues of IP, access to IPs becomes very important. There is a certain level of minimum IP that is required for us to be able to deal with issues of climate change, uh, and therefore, uh, therefore it is important that uh, uh, that technology is unlocked, uh, and then we will be able to, uh, to, to deal with climate change. Thank you. Certainly, as you said, from a tool to a uh, uh, an element of human right, the change uh, or the shift has been so quick that now we are reeling with the challenge of having to match pace and put things in order. Uh, so on this pretext, uh, may I turn to Ms. Lees for the Director General of European Telecommunications Network Operators uh, Association on this very question. Well, yes, and let me start with uh, being frank. I, I might be biased, but this is supported by also some very frank facts. Uh, the world is not on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. The UN SDG report finds that at current rate, it will take 140 years to achieve equal representation leadership in the workplace, 140 but also states that only 22 of the researchers in cutting it fields like AI uh, and, and others are women. So we lack women also in research. Women are still only 40% of graduates uh, in computer science and inform informatics. So let me say that SDG 5 is lagging behind. Um, we need more women in leadership, we need more women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So this is uh, due to the, the fact that if you don't include women, we don't unlock the full value of digital solutions. So uh, if we don't have women, we cannot reduce bias in, for example, training data for machine learning models. But there are, of course, digital solutions which in turn can help achieve equality. So the UN finds that owning a mobile phone is a vital tool for connecting women to other people. 
and giving them crucial access to information and education, but the gap remains uh, far too high still. Also, if we look at other SDGs, uh, such as industry, innovation, and infrastructure, SDG 9, I think it has been mentioned here, and uh, it is crucial. We find that while 95% of the world has at least uh, 3G mobile broadband access, connecting the final stretch is uh, extremely difficult. And uh, there, again, connectivity is only part of the puzzle. I think it needs to be followed with uh, skills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so precise. Uh, over to uh, the Honorable Minister of State of the Maldives. What's your take on this? Thank you. I think, I think it's clear from the, uh, uh, from the answers given by the two panelists before that we are definitely behind. In fact, 30% of the SDG targets have either stalled or gone in reverse. So now, which SDG or which technology is failing which SDG or is, is technology failing these SDGs? I think that's a complex question. But what is actually quite interesting to note, uh, I, think, I think the answer's already been given, so I would like to kind of present an alternative um, phrasing of it. I think the important thing is to make sure nobody is left behind. So if you look at the Maldives, for example, we've got over 15% of our population who still don't use internet. Over 7% of the population still don't have a smartphone. Right, so I think we've got the foundation, we've got to get the foundations, and I think we've heard about those foundations. Making sure we have digital literacy, making sure SDG 5, we've got to get the other half of the population in play, otherwise we are never going to get to reach our targets that we set for ourselves for 2030. Only if half of the population uh, works, that's not going to work. That's we're never going to be able to achieve the, the targets we set for ourselves. So we know that. So we're going to have to concentrate on the vulnerable populations. Uh, so we have to actually look at in digital inclusion. We have to look at digital accessibility to make sure that all SDGs are supported by the new technologies. As much as we talk, like to talk about AI, blockchain, um, earth monitoring stations, well, I'm from the Maldives, so for us important, um, you know, digital technologies have to start from the people, and how do we get them on board? How, for example, in the Maldives, we make sure that the rest of the 15% are in the digital world and rest of the 7% have access to smartphones that can unlock those possibilities for smart health, smart agriculture, smart fisheries, um, protection of and adapting to uh, extreme weather that we face. So ultimately, it's, it's about stakeholders working together uh, to kind of build those foundations at the grassroots level, making sure that our civil society is also part of the solution and the government and the industry works together. It is extremely nice to have the big platform up here as well with Thank the you. government and academia. Everyone needs to work Thank together you, on this. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Uh, over to Mr. Kojo Borke. What are your impressions on this? Um, I'll, I'll be quick. Actually, I'm going to make a quick correction because I know if when I climb down, someone's going to correct me on this. Is that there? There is a uh, a part of the SDGs that speaks to universal internet access. Anyone that drills down and who was around in 2014-15 knows that 9C speaks to the need to connect people in the least developed countries, like universal connectivity. So it does speak to it. And I think in their wisdom, the people who wrote the SDGs and finalized them assumed that ICT would be mainstreamed within. Um, like my colleagues, I'm not completely or too optimistic about our ability to achieve it at this time unless we make those bold steps. So I'm not going to go through each of the uh, SDGs that we're, we are, uh, are failing to get to or look like we're going to fail to get to, in part because of their interconnectedness. They're all dependent on each other. You can't uh, remove or decrease poverty and the impacts of poverty if the environment isn't right. There's an interconnection between them. 
One of the things I feel we are doing well on, and it may be an echo chamber that I'm in, so I have to be careful, is this idea around partnership. So I know goal 17 is around partnership for sustainability, but I, leave, I believe partnership towards all SDG goals has been particularly important. And I say that in part because of Meta's partnership. So Meta has developed, as I told you, these population density maps, as well as other AI-driven solutions that we think can have an impact on the SDGs. As part of that, there's a, a partnership with more than 700 institutions. I mentioned some before, whether it's the World Bank, International Organization of Migration, UN, HCR, as well as many other academic institutions. And what we've seen, this is why I'm, inf I'm infused by it, what we've seen is an impact on, for example, uh, uh, health immunization programs in Malawi, uh, clean water and sanitization, the people know the goals, so I won't mention those, goal six, clean water and sanitization in Rwanda and Zambia, uh, electrification maps in places like uh, Benin and Somalia, and much, much more. So for that reason, yes, we are far away, but as we all know on this, and I have to be careful again about the echo chamber, ICTs can have a profound impact on our efforts to achieve them if we release their potential impact. Thank you, thank you for this profound sharing. Uh, coming to the uh, Under Secretary General himself, you've been quite upfront in admitting that the SDGs, majority of the SDGs have been off track and that, that has certainly been aided by the facts and figures. So what would be, how would you, I mean, which SDGs do you think are terming, I mean, lagging behind in terms of unlocking the potentials of digital solutions? Well, first of all, let me say that to UN, to the, all the member states, all 17 SDGs are equally important. Um, certainly, due to the various uh, factors, now we have a, such a situation that is the sum of the SDGs or SDG targets left behind far more than others. For instance, like the, um, our panelists underline uh, SDGs for education and women and the girls and those of poverty, um, uh, uh, poverty eradication. But let me just add one more example. That is the SDG 11. That is about the sustainable city and the communities. And we now talked about the digitalization would have helped uh, the local government to launch the uh, smart cities. But we have to recognize that, yes, digitalization would help the cities with the more sustainable uh, transportation uh, management and also reducing energy consumption, managing uh, waste of water. Um, but however, many cities in developing countries due to its limited infrastructure and the very limited resources. They even don't have an online presence. Based on a latest study uh, conducted by my department, last year, 47 countries, in the 47 countries, the most popular city does not have such a facility, internet. So we can imagine, with those challenges, how can we talk about the digitalization or digital economy, and we talked about the attainment of the SDGs. We said that the SDGs should be the people-centered, but what is the essence to us? It's equality and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, in this very pretext and from uh, the reflections just shared by all our panelists uh, as they talk or try to dissect the challenges, the prospects, potentials, uh, disparity and the inequalities, uh, let me turn to Ms. Nanako Ishido. Uh, what do you think are the risks of applying digital innovations and solutions that need to be considered in terms of tackling global challenges? And how can these risks be mitigated? Thank you. Uh, I think the fundamental risk here is the diversity in perspectives regarding digital technology uses. Uh, the pace of technological advancement is exceedingly rapid, especially generative AI, and there are varying opinions on how to interact with, with AI. And that was the major point of discussion during this year's D7 Summit held in Japan. Also, there are global giants 
company like Meta <laughs> in this field. And the company with immense products can surpass nations. And it's, uh, I think it's clear that we have yet to establish international consensus on this matter. So everyone thinks differently and simply deciding whether to use AI for a particular purpose it can lead to a different opinion, and that is a risk in itself. Let's take goal 16, please, as an example. Digital technology can promote, uh, it is unclear that digital technology can promote peace. In current conflict between some countries, the digital technology can uh, uh, extensively used. Uh, the technology has the power to assist people, yet it also has the potential to cause harm. Ultimately, the intention of human can be a risk factor, depending on how they use these tools. So to reduce these risks, it is important to have a discussion involving, involving multiple stakeholders. And I believe this, with this the right intention, we can guide this technology in a positive direction. Thank you. Thank you. And this gets me back again to Mr. Lee with the very question. So, here we're talking about the risks on applying digital innovations and solutions to the global challenges. Yeah. Um, uh, if we say that um, uh, we consider the application of the digital solution, uh, we'll bring the, uh, the enormous benefits. But certainly, we have to think about the potential risks. Um, a few observations from my arm. First, that is inequality is a pressing concern. We all learned that a very striking figure that's the 2.6 billion people are still unconnected. So if the majority in the developing world or particularly in um, uh, the LDCs, these developed countries remain unconnected, uh, how we can assure them the benefits of digitalization could it also become that they are part of life. And second is a digital literacy. Just now that my fellow uh, panelists have de delivered um, on this very eloquently. I won't talk to, um, at any more on this. The third thing is environmental challenges. Um, we know the digital brings the more the benefits, but at the same time, the digital infrastructure also contribute to increase the carbon emission. This is a, a very alarming tandem with this AI technology. So the crucial point is that how we can manage it, although we will adopt the sustainable practices in technology to mitigate the environmental damages, that's something when we talk about the digital, we need to bear that in mind. So in promoting digital innovation for SDG challenges, it is imperative that we focus on solutions that directly address those challenges. At the same time, we need to focus more on the potential risks. I couldn't have been understood better. Thank you, Your Excellency. Moving with the same question to Mr. Shilzi Marwala. No, th thank you very much. Without repeating what uh, the good things that have been said uh, by uh, Professor Hido and uh, the Under Secretary General, I think we have a challenge of ethics. I think that is a big challenge that we need to be honest about. I will just to give you an example: the amount of environmental degradation that uh, data centers leave on their wake is quite huge. Issues of, uh, of e-waste. Uh, 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 so, and of course this is embedded in issues of ethics. Then the second one, uh, in terms of uh, uh, privacy and uh, cybersecurity, I think the, the two things that really worry me is the asymmetry of uh, capabilities globally, and it's not just between the global south and, and the global north, it is even within the global north, where you see um, the, this uh, um, uh, asymmetry of, uh, of capabilities. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need a global 
agreements, and this is one area which, which, which proves to be difficult to have global agreement. Even if you have global agreements, there's always, uh, um, you know, uh, cyber warfare is, is a big threat that we really need to, to worry about. I think the issue of access is very important. And for me, when it comes to issues of access, I think the cost of technology, if we do not uh, find the cost that ensure that there is equal, there is equity in access to these technologies, then, then we are not going to be able to tackle global challenges. So, uh, and also quite uh, lastly, I think it's the issue of education. The fact that education is not evenly available to people across the board. Educating the lawmakers so that they can be able to craft rules, regulations, and laws uh, that, uh, that are going to focus on tackling global challenges. Of course, uh, global and local challenges uh, must be seen as, as one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We would now request Mr. Masanori Kondo to build on this. Yes, thank you. Uh, in line with what the uh, previous speaker mentioned uh, in terms of uh, cyber security, I would like to provide one another uh, aspect from a different angle. So global challenges, challenges are global, and not a single project can tackle and solve the issue alone. So which means one way or another, we need to consider collecting and sharing data or information across different stakeholders, domestically, regionally, or internationally. So in the future, as digital solutions evolve, data, inter data inter interoperability will be an issue. And uh, in this context, we need to be mindful so-called um, digital patchwork vulnerability, which means vulnerability comes to the lowest level of security in the network. So uh, we don't, I think we don't need a, a detailed specification or a standardization, but it is not uh, practical. But I think a concept of minimum requirement will facilitate our future work in order to collaborate each other. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lees, for your impressions, please. Yes, um, I mentioned before that while digital pervade many of the SDGs, uh, there is, of course, no single uh, digital SDG setting standards for the digital economy and society, what, how that should look like. But I think uh, this is also one of the risks we have because we throw around the term digital, digital innovation, without necessarily considering what underpins the, the terms. So connectivity does not necessarily lead to achieving the SDGs in itself or greater prosperity. I think digital solution must be based on an internet that is open, inclusive, safe and secure, and respecting human rights. So we might think that rolling out connectivity is, is a, of course, a, a very important part of the, the puzzle, but that must be coupled at all cost with an open internet where decisions are taken in a multi-stakeholder way. So this means governments, academia, private sector, civil society, and never, never, never forget the technical community which defines the crucial standards for the way the open internet works. And uh, uh, while we're working on this in the IGF leadership panel together with my esteemed colleague, uh, Mrs. Ed Stadler Caroline, uh, uh, we're also launching a process to reach out to hear from all of you how you see and how we should define the specific ways that the internet should work today. And I think this would be an essential step to drive digital innovation and solutions in the right direction for the future, making sure digital solutions and innovation work for all people. Thank you. Well, thank you. And with this, I come to Honorable Muhammad Sharif for his insights on this. Thank you. 
as a practitioner, some of, some of the challenges that I face um, include the complexity of technology. Um, digital innovations that we are talking about here, um, be it AI, um, be it space technologies, are becoming increasingly complex. And there are many challenges that arise from this, including cybersecurity risks, including the risks associated with data privacy, uh, and especially in the small island developing um, context or in developing context as a whole, there is a huge lack of expertise when we come, when we try and do this at home. And of course, there's the financial risks. We often tend to throw money into the IT black hole. So we, we, the, there is the risk of overspending on innovations um, that may not provide, the, that may not actually um, get the, uh, you know, a, a, the, that doesn't have the benefits. While at the same time, often, what often happens is the opposite, that we do not fund enough the technologies that have true potential. And then, of course, there is the environment. So as we invest more and more in technology, we've got to think about e-waste. And that also has a, a financial implication to it. Um, then how do we go about um, resolving this? In the Maldives, we've established a dedicated team in the last couple of years uh, so that we know resources are dedicated for this. We are working towards implementing robust security measures, integrating systems into a unified security architecture, making sure that um, we are in compliance with local but also international data privacy standards and regulations, and of course investing in people, training and development. And above all, I think, uh, something that struck to me just a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of days ago uh, uh, during a cybersecurity seminar, someone pointed out to me that we, uh, it, it is good to actually take up an entrepreneurial uh, idea to this uh, digital transformation in government where we um, think you, like a startup. Thank you. Thank you so much. I come to um, Honorable Caroline Ed Stalder. Well, having heard all these smart interventions, uh, some of them longer, some of them shorter, I could be very short in my answer. The risk is that we forget that we are human beings. And I won't stop here. Being human beings means that we need human rights and we need a human rights-based approach. And this is, uh, I think, in the heart of mitigating uh, risks uh, in connection with new technologies and especially also artificial intelligence. Um, if, we, if we do have this uh, human rights-based approach, uh, it contributes essentially to make sure that techno technological progress is inclusive and does not lead voluntarily or unintendedly to discrimination. There is also something um, I heard a few months ago, someone told me that we human beings need, in average, 100 years to adopt to a new technology. And when it comes to the internet, then we are half time there. So about 50 years ago, Windsurf and others invented the internet. So it's really high time now to do something in regard of mitigating the risks and using all the chances um, coming out of these new technologies. I think there are three things we have to do. We have to keep the human oversight. Um, we have to keep transparency and explainability because if we are following these paths, then I think we really could do the best and use it the best way for all of us in all the fields of the SDGs and in all the fields of our, yeah, societies. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Couldn't have said any better, especially as uh, humanness has been a word that has been uh, central to a debate as we advance forward to in the, into the age of AI. Uh, thank you for this very, very uh, important uh, statement and the human caution that you add to your say. Uh, now, uh, let me come to the uh, uh, penultimate question, if I may ask, uh, if I may say, uh, let's turn to policy. Policy um, in this entire debate and in all these deliberations that have been running uh, since the many, many decades 
decades. Uh, policy has been so central uh, to all these debates, deliberations, and actions. Uh, the urgency at the moment as we sit here and discuss the issue that we have brought uh, to the table is because we're running out of time to meet the goals that we set for ourselves. And then there are newer challenges emerging in front of us. And then we are also equally eager to reap or harness from the opportunities that, that we have in our way. So in this pretext, uh, may I turn to Mr. Masanori Kunda first. Uh, so how can we generate more support for digital innovations and solutions to address the SDG challenges in policymaking? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the simple answer is to demonstrate the importance of uh, the project and ask the policymakers to, to support. But seriously, let's consider a question when and why you think you want to support. It may be because you are asked by someone, or you think that you need to, or you want to do. So when do you think you want to do? It may be when you see people in need with your own eyes. It may be because you are happy when you receive gratitude from others. It may be when you think you can change the, change the situation. So whatever the, it is, you take an action when you understand necessity, its, import, its importance, and the fact that you can do it. So one of the ideas here I would like to share with you, this is my personal idea, is that we may consider to create a goodwill ambassador for digital SDGs who conducts digital enlightenment movement to educate policy makers, and other stakeholders. Another idea is a digital policy hackathon. Among policy makers, uh, tech experts, and innovators. I think you are usually on organizer's organized side of hackathon. But you have to be part of the hackathon as a player so that uh, this kind of op opportunity will help and facilitate to make things uh, its own affairs. So with this uh, mindset, I think uh, pe people will tend to support those necessary projects and uh, activities. Thank, Thank you. you. Indeed, great to hear these uh, inputs from you. Uh, let's, let's hear the experts inside from Mr. Kojo Boke on this. Moderator, can you indulge me? Repeat the question for me. I know it's about how do we get policymakers to get behind tech, right, for the SDGs, but help me. Right, I didn't quite get you, maybe because of the distance herein, but I sure, uh, I'm sure that your expert views really count because you, we are the one in the field dealing with all the consequences. So I, w I was asking, do you mind repeating the question for me? Okay, so I can all right, get it I think spot we're, on. we're reeling the same problem, the distance <laughs> issue, okay. All right, so the question was, how do we um, ge generate more support for digital innovations and solutions to address the SDG challenges in policy making? Thank you ever so much. Right. Um, I'm not sure we need much more support from policy makers. Um, in part, my, my assertion stems from the fact that having traveled over the last few weeks to uh, Ghana, uh, uh, Accra, sorry, Lagos, uh, Amman in Jordan, Egypt, and New York, and then come here, come here, I feel like we have a groundwell of support, bigger than a groundwell of support for the use of tech. I agree with my friend from APT who suggests that actually what we need to do is demonstrate that tech even more. And I also agree from the, uh, with my professor uh, here from Japan who spoke about the need to have consultation between government, academia, and private sector, including the biggest players, to determine how we're going to leverage this tech. The one thing I continue to stress, having had all these conversations over the last few weeks, is, to, is, is the need to recognize the opportunity in front of us and to not overplay the risks. And I say that because one of the conversations I had recently was with uh, Professor Mustafa Sisse from the African School of Mathematics or Sciences of Mathematics, who spoke about the fact that actually the kind of technologies that people seem to have such a fear of, AI, is very much an inception phase. I'm not an engineer, but I believe him. Very much at an early stage of development. It isn't gonna be these big uh, AI machines that take over 
And also the fact that actually as I speak to policymakers and as Meta has with other companies signed up to, for example, the US, uh, um, uh, uh, US's voluntary commitments towards AI, and I speak to others in places like Saudi Arabia with their AI ethics and uh, many other places who are developing these things, I, I do feel that many governments are trying to harness that opportunity but put the guardrails in place. And I think that's the most important thing at this time, alongside the many examples that Meta and so many other companies, players, ac academics, have to provide to those governments to prove that we need to take this opportunity. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, over to Ms. Nanako Ishido, what would be your say on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, the benefit of using digital technology in policy making is to enable a wide range of actors, including stakeholders, students, to participate. In the short term, it is important to create an environment where a large number of students can participate in policy making. In the long term, enhancing digital literacy for everyone becomes crucial. It is also important to be proactive in using new technologies such as AI, blockchain, and so on. Uh, we are already using generative AI to come up with solutions to policy problem, And we are starting DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, to kickstart policy action. These efforts are in, already in progress and should be shared worldwide. And most important of all, as the Kondo, Mr. Kondo said, take action. The SDGs are goals. The important thing is, is to take action towards the goal. So the, it's about setting priorities, determining, determining which goals are most important to each of us, to our respective countries, and translating these priorities into concrete action. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. The stress is on action here. Uh, and we wouldn't do justice without putting this question to Your Excellency, Mr. Jun Wan Lee. Well, thank you. That I fully agree with uh, the previous um, uh, panelists. The action actually will bring the difference. Um, with regard to the uh, um, enabling, um, enabling environment to a digital innovation, it is very important to have the policy dimension there. How to do it? My answer is to maximize the participation of the all stakeholders in developing a global framework on the digital innovation, in addition to the bilateral or national policies. How to do it? Secretary General proposed a, digital, a global digital compact, which will be discussed and decided by the world leaders in next September when they gathered in New York again. So we hope that all the stakeholders would involved in this consultation process, including government, parliament, private sector, um, business sectors, uh, academia, Techno, uh, technological, uh, uh, technical communities, individuals, including youth and women, and of course, the UN systems. So by doing so, we would pour all our efforts, our perspectives, our suggestions together to ensure a better environment for the digital innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me a moment now to introduce and invite for a quick thought in this ongoing deliberations herein on this very important theme and to facilitate with our high ministerial uh, respondents. Uh, please be introduced as I invite uh, my fellow moderator, Ms. Jewel Forty, the television producer and presenter of the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Jewel. Thank you so much, Shivani, and thank you to all of our high-level members on the panel. I'll start by asking Mr. Ernesto Rodriguez Hernandez, he's the Deputy Minister of Communications in Cuba, for give us a short response to some of what he has heard here today. Over to you, Mr. Hernandez. Ante todo, First and foremost, I would like to thank all of the organizers for allowing me to take the floor. It has now been 20 years 
since the very first summit on the Society of Information. The documents were approved by heads of state and government from 175 countries. When we look at the debate, developing countries made it possible to try to answer this call in bridging this digital gap. They limit access to knowledge and information in our very own language. 20 years after, we have borne witness that information technology and internet specifically help build fundamental tools for the development of societies. We have also seen that this pact has been especially important for developing countries as opposed to developed countries. There were commitments that have not been re reached after this very first summit. One of these major tasks was to abide by the various requests from all of these stakeholders which hinder social and economic development by from all of these countries that have been impacted by this. The topics that have been mentioned were addressed by the heads of state and government at the G77 in China and also in Havana, Cuba, which was held last month in September 2023, and the role of technology and science in development. At the end of this summit, we ratified the summit to complete it by 20, 2025, and China has put forward a direct link between this summit and the it, in information technologies in fostering development. We also launched a call between this World Summit of the Society of Information and the other outcomes in Addis Ababa and other multi stakeholder uh, policies and also the future summits that will be held. We need to foster the work by G the G77 in China and reviewing the work in this society of information, the G77, the global pact, among many other summits, in order to make sure that we bridge this digital gap between developing countries and developed countries. We iterate that the two, the, two, the we stated that we would focus on working on these digital uh, tools. The very first stage in the Society of Information, which was called Building the Society of Information, this is a global challenge for the new millennium, it set forth a, a common vision for the Society of Information. Among many other attributes, it must be focusing on a holistic individual, focusing on development. This document was meticulously devised and negotiated is in force, full force today. This crystallizes the dream of creating this society of information which was implemented over 20 years ago. Minister of Communications in Cuba, I now invite my fellow Barbadian, Mr. Rodney Taylor, he's a Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, to give his comments. Thank you very much, Joel. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. I bring a perspective um, from the Caribbean, as pointed out, which represents a diverse group of small island states uh, and for whom the achievement of the SDGs is critical. And in fact, their non-achievement in some cases represents an existential threat, particularly when it comes to the environment and climate change. Innovation is the engine of sustainable development. It, en it enables us to find creative solutions to some of the world's most pressing challenges, as pointed out previously by many of our, our panelists. Likewise, access is the bridge that connects innovative solutions to the people who need them the most. And this is not new to any of us here in the room or online today. This is nothing that has not been said. So I think it's now a question of what we, not what must be said, but what must be done uh, differently. 
Government action alone will not suffice, and I think we all understand the value of multi-stakeholder approaches. Within this forum, we have the capacity to refocus in different areas according to our individual areas of expertise, passion, and common interests. We need to promote and fund research and development that addresses the unique needs of vulnerable populations, such as those in SIDS, encourage social entrepreneurship that places the planet, environmental sustainability and equality above profit maximization. Affordability of access is critical in particular to the LDCs in the Global South. Affordable access will expand access to education, healthcare, and so on as pointed out before. The ITU's Partner to Connect initiative is worthy of special mention here and should be given the full support of the global community in particular, those making the most financial gains from the internet economy. We need to accelerate international cooperation and partnerships in other areas as well to share knowledge and agree on workable solutions. The work towards the Global Digital Compact, as pointed out again on the panel, uh, being undertaken by the UN is fully supported and endorsed by the Caribbean. Lastly, education and awareness are important so that those who need it most embrace technology and can be empowered to participate in their own development. The IGF should continue to nurture NRIs that encourage organic and independent formations to discuss these issues in a national and culturally relevant context. And for this reason, the Caribbean celebrated our 19th IGF this year and have supported youth and SIDS IGFs as well. In conclusion, achieving the SDGs in an accelerated fashion is a complex endeavor, but with sustained effort, commitment, and a multifaceted approach, it is possible to make significant progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodney Taylor, the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Joining us via video is Ms. Armida Salcia alice Dvana, Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, allow me to extend my sincere appreciation to the government of Japan, DESA, and ITU for offering me the opportunity to speak at the Internet Governance Forum 2023 in Kyoto. Under the overarching theme of this year's forum, the Internet we want empowering all people, I'm confident that with the active engagement of all stakeholders, this event will help build global consensus for an empowering future for people and the Internet. While digital connectivity brings significant digital div dividends to society, if such dividends are not equitably shared, risk will be increasingly difficult to address. I'm therefore pleased to see that the eight sub-themes chosen for the forum this year are all topical, notably the sub-themes on AI and emerging technologies and digital divides and inclusion. Allow me to share some regional perspective. Digital device and inclusion challenges in Asia and Pacific remains the most digitally dividend or divided region in the world. Our study has highlighted that limited and unaffordable internet access, as well as the gender digital divide, continue to worsen in countries in special situations during the pandemic. Digitally advanced economies such as Japan are racing ahead to embrace emerging technologies, accelerating the transformation to digital societies through frontier technology, digital hubs, and digital governance, while others with limited digital infrastructure and digital skills are adapting more slowly to the rapid stream of digital innovations. On AI and emerging technologies opportunities, the deployment of emerging technologies is particularly promising for Sustainable Development Goals 13 on climate change, which is the only goal in the region where implementation is in reverse. For example, Singapore, through its Smart Nation Initiative, is using AI to drive growth and innovation in a resource-efficient manner, while in Japan, a number of AI-driven applications have enhanced disaster resilience and climate adaptation. Similarly, Republic Korea is investing in AI to develop curriculum and 
teacher training aimed at instilling advanced digital skills that prepare students for an AI-driven future. Work on directing the development of AI through a people-centered approach based on commonly shared human values and rights has just begun, and much remains to be done. Notwithstanding the slow pace and often messiness of multifaceted, multi-stakeholder, and multilateral approaches, it is our best hope for evolving the future we want. Moving forward, I conclude with three messages. We must double our efforts towards closing the widening digital divide by scaling up investment in digital connectivity infrastructure that is ready for the data-intensive traffic of the future. We also need to promote digital literacy and skills that encompass fundamental human values for the productive use of the internet in a responsible manner. Finally, we need to strengthen cooperation between government, private sector, and other stakeholders. In this regard, we are working with member states to implement the action plan of the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative from 2022 to 2026. This action plan serves as a blueprint for regional cooperation action on bridging the digital divide and accelerating digital transformation. I look forward to collaborating with all key stakeholders to achieve universal digital connectivity and digital transformation for all and the future we want. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Alice Jabana. She's the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific SCAP. And also joining us by video is Mr. Axel von Trotzenberg. He's the Senior Managing Director for the World Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I hear somebody whispering behind me, AI. <laughs> Where there is technology, there will also be hitches. Uh, I'm not sure if that's gonna come back to us a little later, but Shivani, I'm gonna hand back over to you, and if it comes back later, we'll, be, we'll finish we up with sure that. We sure will, we sure will. Thank you, Jules, thank you so much. Digital it is, and glitches are bound to come, and that's why we, all these great minds have been put together in one platform. So said this, and uh, it's been a pleasure, and in fact, uh, a matter of gratitude to incorporate the high-level respondents' views and thoughts in this uh, very enriching panel, and said that, as as we uh, move forward to winding up the panel, we cannot do without, uh, without the very concluding thoughts from our esteemed panelists. So let me begin um, by, by, from my most distant panelist from this point, Mr. Kojo Boyke, the Vice President, uh, Meta. Uh, thanks so much. How, how much. how much time do I have? I know you're Two pretty strict. Two minutes for each panelist. Two minutes, right, right. okay. Um, I'll try and pull things together. I think, look, uh, I think everybody in this room, and as I said earlier, many of the people that I've engaged with over the last few weeks, indeed months and years, believe in the opportunity that tech presents. I think that uh, towards the SDGs and, and achieving those goals, which we are all behind on, I think all the panelists heard, heard us speak about that. I think at the same time, there's a recognition that there are risks with greater inequality being caused by tech. The fact that 2.6 billion people remain offline and don't even have access to broadband, let alone the more innovative technologies that will ride on that broadband continues to be an issue. I think my friend from APT mentioned it best, that there is some convincing to do with regard to how we move things forward and get technology to play its role uh, in an optimal way. And part of that is the onus is on companies like ours, first of all, to provide examples, like many I've mentioned today, uh, using our um, uh, 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 population maps and much more, but also to engage in the kind of policy discussion that we have engaged in in the US, in places like Europe, in places like uh, uh, Africa and also in, in places in the Middle East as well and Asia, I'm sure my colleagues will remind me to say, but to, to drive towards action. And I think my learned friend from the ITU and many of the other panelists have said that we, this is not a time to rest on our laurels, that we need to take action. And my earnest desire is we are not 
uh, we don't suffer par uh, paralysis by analysis in terms of some of these things, and we take action. And I'm, I think I'm speaking, or at least preaching to the choir when I say that. Thank so you. So greatly said. Well, I have the privilege of only availing two minutes to each of our panelists for a quick concluding remarks and moving to Ms. Lee's fur from Etna. Thank you. First, it's been a great honor to uh, join this panel today and uh, among such esteemed colleagues. Uh, and it's, it's an important time to, to, to stop and, and think, how can we re revitalize the uh, SDGs? And uh, the SDGs were signed uh, off many years ago, and the world has changed a, a whole lot, much more than we expected. Um, we had a global pandemic that put uh, our societies, health services, and digital uh, structures, infrastructures to the test. And we have um, the latest technology, cutting edge science, the best minds in research actually delivered vaccines for COVID in uh, record time. So while we also saw the world marveled at our, uh, the new potential of artificial intelligence, uh, we all sat ho at home or in the offices testing large language model chatbots and uh, marveled by, by their uh, newfangled magic, I think we're still far from achieving all the SDGs as, as we discussed here today. Uh, and uh, the outlook might be uh, pretty bleak, but I think listening to the panel today and the sheer numbers of SDGs we have mentioned, uh, my, I, I think it demonstrates one important thing, and that is uh, digital innovation, for me, is the unsung hero of uh, SDGs. It's not the only solution, but, and it cannot do it all alone, but digital is our fast track to achieve the SDGs. And we need to do this by including all the stakeholders and we need collaboration of all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, so well said. Now, uh, I'll come to Mr. Kondo shortly. I'll have to wait for a bit as I get a good news that we can now play the video. So this is inviting via this video uh, message, Mr. Axel van Trostenberg, the Senior Managing Director, World Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is a great pleasure to address you at the opening of this year's Internet Governance Forum in Kyoto. My sincere thanks to the organizers of this forum, the government of Japan and the United Nations for inviting us to the event and for the long-standing partnership with the World Bank on the digital agenda. We recognize that today the world's many challenges have become intertwined crises and that the digital agenda has a role to play in the resolution of these crises. The World Bank has made significant efforts to lift a billion people out of poverty in the last three to four decades. But the COVID-19 pandemic has meant an important setback for economic growth and poverty reduction. Renewing progress in our fight against poverty and addressing the many global challenges and crises requires a new approach. That is why we are moving to scale up our financing our knowledge, our data and partnerships to deliver. Digital is playing and will continue to play an ever increasing role for development. Together with people, prosperity, planet and infrastructure, digital is one of the five verticals aiming to communicate more clearly our work and how we aim to put knowledge at the core of the bank's business. Digital is the transformative opportunity of our time. Digital technologies have become a driving force for development to create new jobs and open new markets, to create opportunities and to improve government efficiency and transparency. But we also need to be attentive to the risk of exclusion, of widening the digital divide and worsening the poverty divide. Today's digital development agenda requires both technical solutions and sound foundations to govern the internet and the world's digital spaces. Nearly 2.6 billion people are still offline. 
More than 90% of the population in high-income countries used the internet in 2022 as compared to only 25% in low-income countries. Many people do not have the basic skills to use the internet effectively, but there will be an estimated 150 million new technology jobs over the next five years. 850 million people lack any form of identification, keeping them excluded from the analog and increasingly the digital world and its development promises. Digital solutions remain fragmented in many countries, meaning a missed opportunity for a radically new and efficient government service offering. But simply advancing technical solutions will not be enough because the main foundation of the digital sector is trust. And this trust can only grow where the use of technologies is based on open, inclusive, secure and resilient digital foundations. These trust foundations include access to information for everyone worldwide, protection of privacy and personal information, both whether data is kept in a country or traded across borders, minimized risk to get scammed, hacked or otherwise compromised by cyber criminals, and the freedom for everyone to participate in the internet. If we can advance this agenda, digital will maximize its power to drive human, economic and social development. It will be a global public good serving all of us. I'm encouraged to see experts, government representatives, the private sector and civil society all come together at the Internet Governance Forum in Kyoto. At the World Bank, we are looking forward to deepening our collaboration on this agenda with our partners from around the world. Let us leverage the power of digital to eradicate poverty on a livable planet. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you to all our high ministerial respondents for their great thoughts and for their inputs. I still have two minutes each for our panelists for your final words. Yes, on to Mr. Masanori Kondo, your quick say, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, from Millennium Development Goals to uh, Sustainable Development Goals, issues in front of us have been changing and increasing. And one of the most influential phenomena in the last decades is suddenly emergence and the dissemination of ICT services. So I believe as a resident of this ICT community, ICT offers a canvas of possibilities. It transforms challenges to opportunities. So when we navigate towards our SDGs, it is imperative for ICT community to collaborate with other stakeholders. With cautious optimism, ICT community should play a role of architect of the future. Our commitment and creativity to construct a proud and inspiring future is required. So this is a message I would like to share with you today. And once again, thank you for inviting me for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very beautiful and great thoughts. So we move to Honorable Mr. Muhammad Sharif. You have two minutes. Sir. Thank you. We've heard that the potential for digital technologies in achieving SDGs is immense. Yes, but we are behind in achieving our targets that we set in 2015. We also heard that we need to maybe rethink these targets. The world has changed, but so has technology. The current trends in technology gives us more hope, but also raises questions. Questions about cybersecurity, questions about data privacy, and where does the balance lie? Definitely, as we move forward, we can harness the power of digital technologies to accelerate the progress towards the SDGs. That is a given. Let's ensure that no one is left behind while we are doing it. So inclusivity and accessibility should be front and center of this. 
Let's work together to create a sustainable and inclusive future that is cognizant of the changing environment and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your great call. Over to Professor Nana Koishido. Thank you. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was established right here at this venue, setting a target for greenhouse gas emission in addressing environmental issues. That was 26 years ago. Now, we look at Kyoto through the lens of SDGs. We see that Kyoto has been committed to sustainable city development for a long time. It served as the Japan's capital for over 1,000 years, starting 1,200 years ago. And even the tea shop nearby has been in operation for more than a millennium. There are 50,000 companies in Japan that have been in business more than 100 years, the largest number in the world. And 3,000 companies that have been in business more than 200 years, the majority in the world. In terms of corporate management, Japan symbolizes the sustainable management. Kyoto, Japan, it's such a place. It is a good place to think about sustainability. So thank you very much for coming to Kyoto. Enjoy Kyoto. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. To Mr. Sishilzi Marlava. No, 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 th thank you very much. It is clear that um, we are lagging behind on SDG, as, the, as we noted at the SDG summit. But it is actually up to all of us. We have personal responsibilities to make sure that uh, we consume and produce responsibly, uh, to make sure that uh, we put pressure on our lawmakers uh, to ensure that they take the correct decisions, uh, to ensure that we invest in education and infrastructure and increase access in the, in, in, within the countries and across uh, uh, different countries. But for us to be able to do all this, we need uh, a strong public-private partnerships. It is clear that uh, digital technologies, you actually have more knowledge and, uh, and capacity in private hands. And therefore, government cannot do this thing alone. So we need to get all the people uh, together to be able to, internationally, to be able to come up with, uh, with a way forward that is going to be sustainable. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to Honorable Caroline Ed Stoltler. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I would like to agree with you. We are lacking behind, but it's never too late to turn to action. And I would say I conclude right the same way as I started this conversation by mentioning again that this is a watershed moment uh, and that big challenges are always accompanied also by chances and changes. And I would say we should really take this moment and get to action. And there is one action, I don't think so that we discussed it in, in detail, I would like to mention that. As democracies, as rule of law and human rights-based societies, we should really get actions also through our parliamentarians because they are representing us and of course the governments. Um, I'm representing also the Austrian government in this regard and I think we should really take the moment and set the right measures. It's not up to the econ economic uh, enterprises to set the measures, but it's up to the parliamentarians and to the governments. And together we can do that in a way like we are doing this today, sharing our experiences, our um, expectations, uh, also what we already achieved, because don't always blame what we are not have to achieve in the future and what not has not been done so far, but let's also see what we already achieved, and I think this is a lot when we are thinking back uh, to the boost of uh, digitalization also during the face of this horrifying pandemic, and let's use this also for the future so it's never too late. Let's get to action now.
Thank you so much, Madam Minister. And for the final thoughts, over to His Excellency, the Under Secretary General, Mr. Jun Huali. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to join the panelists to, to share our own perspectives. Um, eight years ago, the world leaders agreed to launch this 2030 Agenda, 17 SDGs. We know, we recognize that we are left behind. But certainly, there's still hope. It's the time for action. It's time for change. How to revitalize the SDGs? Absolutely, digital serves as one of the most powerful means or the instruments. And then how to do it? Three points from me. First, accelerate the digital application for SDGs. Focused on achieving SDG or specific targets and added values for developing countries and vulnerable communities. We must ensure that equality and inclusion would still remain at the center of the digitalization. Second, enhance infrastructure and the digital, cap uh, digital capabilities. The special focus should be given to how to bridge the gaps or digital divide between the countries, especially for those countries in vulnerable situations like LDCs, SEEDs, and our LDCs. And also, we need to think about how we inject more focus for the local community to make the digital solution for the local community and the local economies. Last but not least, strengthen digital cooperation across all countries. We must ensure that safe, inclusive, secure, and affordable digital access for every country, for all the individuals. Let us our mantle, our uh, promise to the old um, countries, to all individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And I believe this very much uh, addresses uh, the uh, much you know, raised uh, uh, queries, concerns, and the gaps, uh, the challenges that we uh, I mean, talked about in course of our discourse and, which, and an observation that's so general in, in all of these stakeholder community. Uh, it's, trust me, it's been a distinct honor for me to be moderating this very, very enriching panel. And I cannot thank you so much to each and every panelist herein uh, for, for, uh, for sharing your very valuable time and for the value that you've added to this very, very pertinent discussion. Thank you for granting me this honor. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, this deliberation is meant to be a path forward. We have, we have challenges, we have limitations, shortcomings. There are multiple realities to address to. But then uh, the idea, the gesture, and the aspiration of us all is to look forward. So this, uh, the, the, the session certainly is a, a way forward. And uh, not that digital solutions is a magic wand. Uh, not so. And coming from, I mean, reaping from the reflections of the panels, uh, if we're looking at digital solutions to add impetus to the pace of development, of our development, certainly more care, more precision, planning and strategizing our action will help us attain the needful and avoid the um, unwanted. And the emphasis certainly has been on the increased investment of actions, innovations, ideas, thoughts, and most of all, collaboration and cooperation amidst all stakeholders, entities at all tiers. Said this, and with this notion, I rest my mic here in. Thank you to the members in the audience as well for being a great part of this deliberation. And as we end, may I invite all our distinguished uh, members in the panel to kindly take to the uh, left of the stage for a quick uh, group photo opportunity. And as I thank my fellow moderator, I also have this privilege of inviting uh, Ms. Jewel up on stage for this group photo opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all from this discussion.